When you are looking for an honest opinion, when you really want help, you're going to go to a person who is not afraid to tell you the truth. And while you know who the people are that you can go to when you want to be stroked or when you want to be made to feel better, when you need help and you need an honest, honest, straightforward, truthful answer, you'll respect strength not weakness. Weakness is making somebody saying the thing that makes somebody else feel good. Strength is operating from integrity, from authenticity, from honesty. And people respect that. I know in my own life when, uh, when I really want to know what it is that I can do to improve something, I know that my wife isn't afraid to tell me that. There's a lot of people who are. The people who work for me who don't want to tell me that, who are going to tell me the things that are going to make me feel good and make them look good and so on. But I know that my wife, Marcy, will not be afraid to tell me, this is what you have to do, or this is what's missing, or this. And sometimes I don't even like it. And sometimes I, I rail against it. But I always go to her when I want when I want help or when I want assistance because I know that she's not afraid to tell me the truth. Operating from strength really means operating from effectiveness in your life. It's almost like you have to develop a code of non-victim ethics for yourself that says, I am a valuable, important, significant, divine creation. I am here for a very short time. While I'm here in form, in the physical body that I'm in, I am entitled to fulfill the purpose or the destiny that uh, that I have been assigned while I'm here. I believe in that, that I'm here for a purpose. And I'm going to get my life on that purpose. And anyone or anything that gets in the way of that, as long as I can behave towards them in a moral and just and honest way, I can say to myself in my moral code of ethics, you do not have a right to interfere. No one has a right to interfere with anyone else's right to live their life the way they want to. No one. As long as you're not hurting anybody else in the process of operating from strength, as long as you're not interfering with somebody else's right to do the same, then whatever it is that you're doing is perfectly all right. You have to be what I think of as quietly effective. And the way that you are quietly effective is you do not teach people not to victimize you with words. Let me emphasize that. Words are not the tools of the quietly effective person operating from strength. It is behavior that counts. You teach people with your behavior how you want to be treated. And here we are trying to pull our own strings and be our own person and talking endlessly and ceaselessly and having these arguments and discussions and, and it still goes on and it still goes on and you still find yourself the victim and you still find yourself picking up after others or, or uh, not being respected or whatever it may be. There's an old saying, it's one of the secrets of the universe, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. And not one moment before, doing is what teaches people how to understand you. So it is in the process of doing, when someone behaves towards you in a way that is to victimize you, and this is true of virtually everything, somebody who is yelling and screaming at you, and uh, whether it's your husband or your wife or one of your children or a clerk or whatever, and if you stand there and scream back, it's just words against words and it doesn't mean anything. But if you leave quietly, leave the room and go into another room, you're sending a signal. I am too dignified and too valuable and too important a person. I think too much of myself to stand here or sit here and take that kind of abuse. So I will be leaving. And you don't have to say those words, you just do it. And in every single expression wherein you are victimized through conversation or through words, there is a way to teach people with your behavior that you are a person who operates from strength rather than weakness. The Queen of England, the President of the United States, the generals that are in the, in the armed forces, the doctors who serve you, the, uh, the, the very rich people who live in the, uh, in the fancy homes in the suburbs, 
the entertainers, the sports stars, all of these people, whoever they are, the movie stars, whoever these people are, they are no different than you. That's one of the great lessons I learned when I uh, toured uh, the country many years ago for this book and for uh, your erroneous songs and met uh, on, uh, appearing on The Tonight Show many times and then Dinah Shore Show and John Davidson and all of these shows that were very, very popular at that time. And I met so many of the, of the top uh, stars in music and in uh, entertainment and, and sports and, uh, and the recording industry. And, and it was uh, always interesting to me that, they were, that none of them, these were the people that were your heroes, none of them were uh, any better than, uh, than I was. I remember what President uh, Carter said be, when he was running for office, uh, and they asked him if he thought he was qualified to run for president. He said, well, I really never thought I was until I met all the other people who were running, and then I felt I was just as qualified as they were. And that's always the uh, uh, effect that it has on me when I meet somebody who's in this high position of authority, who's got, and I meet them and I talk with them and I find out that they have the same... Uh, the same difficulties and the same foibles and the same uh, problems and and the same pimples and the little blemishes and, uh, and they smell bad too when they wake up in the morning and they and they're, and they're not any better or, or different than any of the rest of us. You are human. You are connected to all the rest of us through that that invisible intelligence that runs through all form in the universe. And you are just as valuable. And in God's eyes, no one is any better than anyone else. Know that. And know that, that it's not only true in God's eyes, but it's true in your eyes as well. The first is that force always creates a counterforce. Force creates a counterforce, whereas power is always creates grace. Grace and power, over and over again, he reports the research, that power is something that will bring grace, that will bring God, will bring consciousness to the presence of it. Whereas force always creates a counterforce. So that when you have a force, that is, if you react with shame, if you try to make your children feel ashamed, what are they going to do back? They resent, and what are they going to try to do to you? some way of making you feel ashamed as well. It, it happens every time. You just have to watch it. You try to shame them and watch if they don't try to shame you. You said I couldn't do that and then you have to be punished for that. But you did that. You said this right away. Shame creates more shame. You've created a lowered energy field. They're weakened. You're weakened. And it works not just with shame, but with fear, with anxiety, with anger. Every time we use any of these, a counterforce is created. The second quality is that force is always loud, aggressive, whereas power is silent. That you raise energy levels through silence. And there's very little movement required when you are empowering. Whereas when you get louder, screaming, aggressive, more outgoing, and so on. The third is that force is always moving against something. That's what force is. So whatever it is that you have, we have to move against it. We have to mobilize our forces and defeat it. Whereas power does not move at all. The fourth thing is that force is always incomplete. Therefore, it must be fed energy. You must constantly feed energy of force. You must constantly be talking to it. You must constantly be upgrading it. You must constantly be trying to make, um, make it attract more energy. It's always demanding of energy. Whereas power is total and complete, requires nothing from outside itself. Power does not demand anything out there, not any weapons. It doesn't need any... Uh, any, any arguments to win. Power is that which you are connected to silently. The fifth, force always makes demands. Whenever you are in force, and if you look at any of those um, emotions and energy levels below 200, you will see that there's a demand to each one of them. Whereas power has no needs whatsoever. It is, it is at peace. The sixth 
This force is constantly consuming. It has insatiable appetite. It is constantly demanding more. And in the process, it consumes, and in the process of consuming, it destroys. Power is always content, makes no demands, and needs nothing to consume. Seven, force always takes energy away. It takes your energy and takes it with it. Whereas power energizes. It gives forth. It supplies and supports. And it gives life energy. When you go to God, when you go to spirit, when you go above 200 to any of those levels, what you are doing is you are energizing those around you and sending it out Whereas when you're in any of the ones below 200, you are taking energy away. The eighth is that force is always associated with judgment and generally makes us feel badly about ourselves. Any of those emotions, any of those thoughts have to do with judging and ultimately when you experience those thoughts or you're in the presence of someone who is using those thoughts, you will end up feeling badly or worse for the experience. Whereas power is associated with compassion, radical humility, and always makes us feel positive about ourselves. When you encounter someone whose thoughts are above 200, after that encounter, you will feel better for having been in their presence, based upon not just what you talk about, but even the feelings that you have. Whereas when you're associated with or around people who are using the techniques below 200, you feel yourself feeling badly, worse, and depleted of energy. Number nine, force always polarizes because it demands conflict in order to survive. Force and conflict go together. Power the energy of power above 200 will unify and make you feel more like you belong, a sense of belonging. Number 10, I just put it this way, the, in force, the cost is always very high because enemies are always being created. Force needs an enemy. It costs to stay in a state of force. Whereas power has no cost whatsoever. It's absolutely free. It's graceful. It's silent. It's easy. It's non-consuming. It makes no demands. The 11th, and I've always been intrigued by this, the 11th uh, quality or characteristic of force, force always requires proof because it's literal and it's therefore arguable. Whereas... Power deals with intangibles, and it knows that health is better than disease. It doesn't need any proof of that. It knows that honor is better than dishonor. It knows that faith is better than doubt, and that being constructive is better than destructive. And you don't need a chi-square and you don't need an analysis of variance, and you don't need a statistical test to be able to prove it, and you don't need to argue about it. There's an awareness that is internal, that is instinctive, that says, I don't have to go out there and show anything. It's why it's quiet. I know it is better to be honorable than it is to be dishonorable. I know it is better to be honest than to steal. I don't need proof of that. I know that it is better to be healthy than to be in a state of disease. I know that life is better than death. I know this. I don't have to prove it. I don't have to explain it. I live in a consciousness of empowerment in which I don't have to go through and look outside of myself to validate whether these things that I know instinctively and intuitively are correct. It's my experience that most people live their lives in the wake by hanging on to personal histories to justify their self-defeating behaviors and the scarcity in their lives. They hang on to past pains, abuses, and shortcomings as calling cards to announce a poor me status to everyone they meet within minutes of their introduction. 
I was abandoned as a child. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an incest survivor. My parents were divorced, and I've never gotten over it. The list could go on for hours and hours. Your past is over. By bonding to your past, you not only ensure that you'll be immobilized today, but you prevent yourself from healing. By referring to past struggles and using them as the reasons for not getting on with your life today, you're doing the equivalent of attributing to the wake the ability to drive the boat. This also works in reverse. Many people refer to the good old days that are gone forever as the reason why they can't be happy and fulfilled today. Everything has changed. No one respects anybody else like they used to. A dollar used to be worth a dollar. Now everything is so overpriced. People don't seem to want to help out like they did in the past. When we were kids, we respected authority. Today's kids walk all over their parents. This is also living in the wake and assigning responsibility to the past for why you can't be successful or happy today. Getting out of the wake. Imagine a pencil with the ability to only write your past history. It has no use otherwise. All of your past is in that pencil. Are you going to keep it? What for? Are you going to give it up? Perhaps Omar Khayyam will inspire you with this poem written a thousand years ago. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out one word of it. You can cry all night about the history in that pencil, all that it contains, and all you wish you could erase, or bring it back again. But all of your tears can't wash out one word of the past, as the poet-philosopher reminds you. You want to let go of your personal history that's symbolized by that pencil, but when you walk away from it, no matter how far you walk, you look back and there it is. You're ready to be rid of your personal history and to move fully into the present moment, but the pencil is always there when you look back. I suggest that you pick up the pencil and with compassion allow the words, wounds, and pains of the past to be written, embraced, examined, understood, accepted, and loved for all that you've learned and experienced. The act of picking it up and embracing it will give you the strength to transform the past into song, poem, paint, or ritual if you feel called to do those things, or to throw it away in your unique way. Embracing Your Personal History In a universe that's an intelligent system with a divine creative force supporting it, there simply can be no accidents. As tough as it is to acknowledge, you had to go through what you went through in order to get to where you are today, and the evidence is that you did. Every spiritual advance that you will make in your life will very likely be preceded by some kind of a fall or seeming disaster. Those dark times, accidents, tough episodes, periods of impoverishment, illnesses, abuses, and broken dreams were all in order. They happened so you can assume they had to, and you can't unhappen them. Embrace them from that perspective, with help if you need it, and then understand them, accept them, honor them, and finally, retire and or transform them in your own way. I know someone who gives them a new job description. Become free to immerse yourself in this moment, the now that's called the present, because it's simply that, a present to open, relish, nurture, play with, and enjoy, and explore. All you get is now. The willingness and ability to live fully in the now eludes many people. While eating your appetizer, don't be concerned with the dessert. When reading a book, notice where your thoughts are. While on vacation, be there instead of thinking about what should have been done and what has to be done when returning home. Don't let the elusive present moment get used up by thoughts that aren't in the here and now. There's an irony to this habit of having your mind drift to other times and other places. You can only drift off in the now, because now is all you ever get. So drifting off is a way of using up your present moments. You do indeed have a past, but not now. And yes, you have a future, but not now. And you can consume your now with thoughts of then and maybe, but that will keep you from the inner peace and success you could be experiencing. It's doubtful that the other creatures waste the present in thoughts of past and future. A beaver only does beaver, and he does it right in the moment. He doesn't spend his days wishing he were a young beaver again or ruminating over the fact that his beaver siblings received more attention or his father beaver ran off with a younger beaver when he was growing up. He's always in the now. We can learn much from God's creatures about enjoying the present moment rather than using it up consumed with guilt over the past or worry about the future. Practice living in the moment and refuse to allow any thoughts based on your past to define you. Stop and take notice of all that's in your immediate space. The people, creatures, vegetation, cloud formations, building designs, everything. Stay in the present by meditating and getting closer to the ultimate now. 
which is God. God is only here and now. Think about this. God will not be doing anything different one hour from now than God is doing right now. And God is not doing anything different now from what God was doing a thousand years ago. The truth is that you can only come to know God if you're willing to be at peace in the present moment. You will only come to truly know God when you give up the past and the future in your mind and merge totally into the now, because God is always here now. Very few people understand and live this principle, largely because of their conditioning and unwillingness to train their minds in present moment living. That's one of the reasons why I sometimes say that it's never crowded along the extra mile. On the extra mile, choosing inner peace and attracting success into your life while living in the present moment becomes a way of being. You can begin by releasing your personal history from your repertoire of available excuses for why you're not living in peace. Treat yourself as if you already are what you'd like to be. Whatever it is that you envision for yourself, no matter how lofty or impossible it may seem to you right now, I encourage you to begin acting as if what you would like to become is already your reality. This is a wonderful way to set into motion the forces that will collaborate with you to make your dreams come true. To activate the creative forces that lie dormant in your life, you must go to the unseen world, the world beyond your form. Here is where what doesn't exist for you in your world of form will be created. You might think of it this way. In form, you receive information. When you move to spirit, you receive inspiration. It is this world of inspiration that will guide you to access anything that you would like to have in your life. What it means to become inspired. Some of the most significant advice I've ever read was written more than 2,000 years ago by an ancient teacher named Patanjali. He instructed his devotees to become inspired. You may recall that the word inspire originates from the words in and spirit. Patanjali suggested that inspiration involves a mind that transcends all limitations, thoughts that break all their bonds, and a consciousness that expands in every direction. Here is how you can become inspired. Place your thoughts on what it is you'd like to become, an artist, a musician, a computer programmer, a dentist, whatever. In your thoughts, begin to picture yourself having the skills to do these things. No doubts, only a knowing. Then begin acting as if these things were already your reality. As an artist, your vision allows you to draw, to visit art galleries, to talk with famous artists, and to immerse yourself in the art world. In other words, you begin to act as an artist in all aspects of your life. In this way, you're getting out in front of yourself and taking charge of your own destiny at the same time that you're cultivating inspiration. The more you see yourself as what you'd like to become, the more inspired you are. The dormant forces that Patanjali described come alive and you discover that you're a greater person than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Imagine that, dormant forces that were dead or non-existent, springing into being and collaborating with you as a result of your becoming inspired and acting as if what you want is already here. By having the courage to declare yourself as already being where you want to be, you will almost force yourself to act in a new, exciting, and spiritual fashion. You can also apply this principle to areas other than your chosen vocation. If you're living a life of scarcity and all of the nice things that many people have are not coming your way, perhaps it's time to change your thinking and act as if what you enjoy having is already here. This doesn't involve deception, arrogance, or hurting others. This is a silent agreement between you and God in which you discreetly work in harmony with the forces of the universe to make your dreams become a reality. This involves a knowing on your part that success and inner peace are your birthright, that you are a child of God, and as such, you're entitled to a life of joy, love, and happiness. In your relationships with your lovers, co-workers, and family, act as if what you would like to materialize in those relationships is already here. If you want a sense of harmony in the workplace, maintain a clear vision and expectation of this harmony. Then you're out in front of your day, seeing 5 o'clock arriving peacefully for everyone when it's still 7.30 in the morning. Each time you have an encounter with someone, your 5 o'clock vision pops into your head, and you act in a peaceful, harmonious way so as not to nullify what you know is coming. Furthermore, you act toward everyone else as if they, too, are all that they're capable of becoming. These kinds of expectations lead you to say, I'm sure you'll have everything ready this afternoon, rather than, you're always late with everything and I wish you'd get on the ball. When you treat others in this way, they also fulfill the destiny that you've reminded them is there for them. In your family, particularly with your children, it's important to always have this little thought in mind. Catch them doing things right. 
remind them often of their inherent brilliance, their capacity for being responsible, their innate talents, and their fantastic abilities. Treat them as if they're already responsible, bright, attractive, and honorable. You are so terrific. I'm positive you'll feel great about your interview. You're so smart. I know you'll study well and do well on that exam. You're always connected to God, and God doesn't do sickness. You're going to feel much better tomorrow at this time. When you act towards your children, parents, siblings, and even more distant relatives, as if the relationship was great and was going to stay that way, and you point out their greatness rather than their goofiness, it is their greatness that you will see. In your relationships to your significant other, whomever that may be, be sure to apply this principle as frequently as you can. If things aren't going well, ask yourself, am I treating this relationship as it is or as I would like it to be? So how do you want it to be? Peaceful, harmonious, mutually satisfying, respectful, loving? Of course you do. As such, before your next encounter, see it in those ways. Have expectations that focus on the qualities of inner peace and success. You'll find yourself pointing out what you love about that person rather than what they're doing wrong. You'll also see the other person responding to you in love and harmony rather than in an embittered way. Your ability to get out in front of yourself and see the outcome before it transpires will cause you to act in ways that bring about these results. This strategy for living works for virtually everything. Before I speak to an audience, I always see them as loving, supportive, and having a terrific experience. Before writing, I see myself with no writer's block, being inspired and having spiritual guidance available to me at all times. As A Course in Miracles reminds me, if you knew who walked beside you at all times, you could never experience fear again. This is the essence of inspiration, as well as seeing the future in terms of how you want it to be, and then acting exactly in that manner. What being open to everything means. Everything means just what it says, no exceptions. When someone suggests something to you that conflicts with your conditioning rather than responding with, that's ridiculous, we all know that's impossible, say instead, I've never considered that before, I'll think about it. Open yourself up to the spiritual ideas of all people and listen with an open mind to crazy schemes and ideas that at first seem to be outrageous. If someone suggests that crystals can cure hemorrhoids, that natural herbs can lower cholesterol, that people will eventually be able to breathe underwater, or that levitation is possible, listen and be curious. Let go of your attachments to what you've been trained to believe. Open your mind to all possibilities, because whether you believe something is possible or impossible, either way, you'll be right. How can that be true? Your agreement with reality and all that's possible determines what you'll become. If you're convinced that you can't become wealthy and famous or artistic or a professional athlete, a great singer, or whatever, you will act upon that inner conviction that prevents you from manifesting what you'd really like. All that you'll get from your effort is being right. When you need to be right, you're attached to your conditioned reflex of the way things are and always have been, and you assume they always will be. Releasing your attachments. Your attachments are the source of all your problems. The need to be right, to possess someone or something, to win at all costs, to be viewed by others as superior, these are all attachments. The open mind resists these attachments and consequently experiences inner peace and success. To release attachments, you have to make a shift in how you view yourself. If your primary identification is with your body and your possessions, your ego is the dominant force in your life. If you can tame your ego sufficiently, you'll call upon your spirit to be the guiding force in your life. As a spiritual being, you can observe your body and be a compassionate witness to your existence. Your spiritual aspect sees the folly of attachments because your spiritual self is an infinite soul. Nothing can make you happy or successful. These are inner constructs that you bring to your world rather than what you receive from it. If you think peaceful thoughts, you'll feel peaceful emotions, and that's what you'll bring to every life situation. If you're attached to being right or absolutely need something in order to be at peace or to be successful, you'll live a life of striving, yet never arriving. It's possible to have a burning desire, yet not have attachments. You can have an inner vision of what you intend to manifest and still detach yourself from the outcome. How? Consider this observation in A Course in Miracles. Infinite patience produces immediate results. It sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? Infinite patience implies an absolute certainty that what you'd like to manifest will indeed show up in a perfect order and exactly on time. The immediate result you receive from this inner knowing is a sense of peace. When you detach from the outcome, you're at peace, and you'll ultimately see the fruits of your convictions. 
Suppose you had a choice between two magic wands. With wand A, you can have any physical thing you desire by simply waving it. With wand B, you can have a sense of peace for the rest of your life, regardless of what circumstances arise. Which one would you pick? A guarantee of stuff or inner peace for the remainder of your life? If you opt for peace, then you already have wand B. Simply have a mind that is open to everything but attached to nothing. Let it all come and go as it will. Enjoy it all, but never make your happiness or success dependent on an attachment to anything, any place, and particularly any person. In all of your relationships, if you can love someone enough to allow them to be exactly what they choose to be, without any expectations or attachments from you, you'll know true peace in your lifetime. True love means you love a person for what they are, not for what you think they should be. This is an open mind and an absence of attachment. In essence, I'm urging you to stop taking your life so personally. You can end any and all suffering by reminding yourself that nothing in the universe is personal. Of course, you've been taught to take life very personally, but this is an illusion. Tame your ego and absolutely free yourself from ever taking anything personally. Keep these thoughts in mind, particularly when you feel lost or unsure of your purpose. My purpose is about giving. I'll direct my thoughts off of me and spend the next few hours looking for a way to be of service to anyone or any creature on our endangered planet. This will bring you back to a realization that it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're able to give. In order to fully give and be of service and ultimately feel purposeful, you must be able to say yes when you ask yourself, do I really possess what it is that I wish to give away?